So this was about creativity. And now the next panel is on creativity and business. Troy, who is coming on stage? Uh, so we have uh, our good friend uh, Philip from Sony Music. So uh, Philip's uh, CEO of Sony Music, uh, GSA, Germany, Switzerland, Austria. Uh, background as a music attorney and also a talent manager, but known as a maverick and forward thinker in, in the business. Uh, we also have the recording artist, producer, and entrepreneur, Ryan Leslie. Uh, Ryan's one of the smartest people I think I've come across in the business. Uh, Harvard graduate, uh, incredibly smart guy. Uh, we also have our friend Tom from So Far Sounds. Tom's the co-founder, uh, the world's largest live music discovery community. And then we have, last but not least, our good friend Ralph Simon, who's a co-founder of Zamba, but uh, a maverick in the world of mobile and the founder of uh, Mo Mobil Mobilium uh, Advisory Group. So uh, welcome, guys. Hey, thanks. So, so this panel, um, basically, you know, we're just kind of talking about just where we are in the music industry, the future of the music business, and the current state. But uh, as we were preparing, you know, one of the things was that, uh, that came up was that Mark Twain saying, uh, the reports on my death have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, you know, when people talk about the music industry, they kind of talk about, you know, just the death of, uh, of music, and, you know, it's this negative narrative that's been, uh, that's been out there. But, you know, in my experience and, you know, and, and all throughout my conversations, this seems to be this optimistic outlook on what's happening in, in the music industry. Um, but I wanted to kick off the conversation, um, I guess talk to you, Ryan, uh, just a bit about, you know, when we look at what Taylor Swift called her music from Spotify, and, you know, it's this huge complaint that the streaming services aren't paying out, you know, to artists. Um, I just wish your overview from, from through the, in, the lens of an artist on the current state of the business. Well, I mean, my last two records actually haven't been on Spotify, uh, but after uh, taking a page out of Ed Sheeran's book, I realized that uh, really it's about discovery. And so when you don't look at it as, a, as necessarily a revenue driver, you look at it as a discovery so that people can discover your music and then actually give you revenue in other ways. Um, I, I, think it's, I, I, I think it's actually a great outlet. So my next album will be on Spotify. Interesting. And then I guess, uh, you know, I'll go to Tom next. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of conversation right now just around uh, the disruption and distribution in the record business and everything else, um, but not a lot of disruption and innovation in the live music space. Um, can you tell us a bit about So Far Sounds and, and what you guys are doing to innovate in the, in the live music space? Um, absolutely. So I suppose you could describe So Far as the open source live nation. Um, what that means is we are a global curated community hosting secret, intimate concerts in people's living rooms in hundreds of cities every month all around the world. Um, and for us, in terms of disruption, it was born out of a product dissatisfaction, um, which basically means we were tired of going to crap gigs. And, <laughs> uh, and what we found was that that sentiment was shared by people all over the world. Uh, and we were able to use techn technology to bring those people together in ways that they hadn't previous. So, so I, I guess going to you, Philip, um, it's been a ton, of, a ton of conversation around just where the state of the major, major labels. You know, um, I think major labels have gotten, you know, a, a, a bum rap over the years, just in terms of, you know, especially now just with the lack of distribution of royalties, you know, through, through streaming. And then with the discovery of a lot of new acts, you know, and with Ryan specifically being an independent artist, is there a place for major labels in, in today's music industry? 
Definitely. I think um, you would be a great person to help me answering that because you are one of the most prolific and uh, most successful artist managers and most of your clients, um, not all, but many and most of them are with music majors. So I think that the story that the music major industry is dead is really very much 2000 and um, we have moved on and um, I think that the majors have understood that they um, have a great place amongst all other ways of working in the music industry which is the indies which is D2C so I think we all learned to find our place in a very productive coexistence so so as the as the distribution systems evolve uh, how do you see the the, the label actually provide providing a service that an art but that an artist would find useful so I think, in general, I, our role has evolved from formally basically being sometimes sort of a gatekeeper and sometimes uh, labels tended to see themselves as creative, hierarchic um, enablers. I think nowadays we are more like creative workbenches. We provide a set of tools for artists who come to us and who are all, who are all looking for individual um, solutions for either just distributing music or marketing and distributing their music or promoting marketing and distributing music and a lot of them also come to um, work with us in, in, in a team to have their music um, curated and developed and get some creative advice so all of this along the value chain um, can be done by a major um, but at our heart, obviously, we are still a bunch of creative people who are looking for the best song, for the hit, and for the most talented act. Great. And, you know, I think one of the things that, that we've noticed is that um, it goes to what you were saying, Ryan, just, you know, about discovery and just being in as many places as possible. Uh, just and, and right now in the world, it feels like every, it, it's more consumption of music than ever. It used to be a time where discovery was kind of going to your friend's house and it was kind of looking through their albums. And, um, but, but now you find kids listening to, you know, things from back in the day to, you know, to music all, all throughout the world. Um, Ralph, I know, I know from a global standpoint and kind of looking at mobile, and, you know, Spotify just announces, you know, I think it's 15 million paid subscribers and, uh, and 50 million uh, subscribers overall. What is that going to mean globally when, you know, um, when it's 150 million people uh, paying for music? And then uh, I know you do a lot of work in the emerging markets. How does that, what's the effect of the emerging markets on the business as well? Well, I think the most uh, influential element now is the fact that we're living in the age of the screenager, not the teenager, the screenager. Why screenagers? Mobile phones, tablets, PCs, screens, screenagers. How many people here in this audience are screenagers? <laughs> Everybody. So uh, you speak about Spotify. If there's 7.2 billion people with mobile phones worldwide, you're seeing the proliferation of music services around the world. There's a company in India called Hungama that are the biggest content makers of Bollywood, and they've got a whole gamification program on their Spotify. Their iTunes service, as it is, is called Artist Allowed, and they've got a self-gratification button. Each time you download a track, you get a free Bollywood clip, which, of course, in India makes a big difference. So people are seeing more and more and more stuff on video. Video is really becoming the central uh, element through which people are experiencing music. YouTube, as an example, uh, millions, billions of views, like Gangnam Style had 2.4 billion views on YouTube. So that's a new metric. But certainly in terms of what Spotify has done, providing a whole new streaming service, that's part of this changing Catherine wheel of different musical uh, elements that will bring music to a wider audience. That's really exciting. I really just want to add, that's you telling these things, I think that's really showing us what potential is still ahead of us. And I'm a generation that sort of has been just in between. And for me, there's, the future is really, really bright for the music business. And I do think that the transformation from download to streaming 
is much, much bigger and much, much more um, of importance than the one from physical to download. I think we're just about to experience the most fascinating aspects of music, which is ubiquity, mobility, and sociability. There's nothing better to talk about than about a new song that you've heard on the radio. And I think all these factors really make music so relevant for the digital age. And that's what we love about it. And it's, um, but it's fascinating for music discovery because, like you say, a kid now has the whole 20th and 21st century of music there to discover instantly. I mean, does that impact how you think about like Sony's historic catalog of music because suddenly that can just be pulled out of the ether so much more simply and so much more accessibly. It's true, funnily enough, our, our catalog, so basically all the, the music pieces that we have from artists that are not producing or not active anymore um, or have deceased, um, we see that streaming is extremely taking off in this field of our repertoire. And um, this is really, there are so many things that can be rediscovered in music. And I mean, we've just seen a legend that uh, has not only been rediscovered, but uh, made himself basically be thrown into the future by his own creativity. So absolutely right. There's a big perspective on that. Now you're doing A&R on your own catalog. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we have to. So, so uh, Ryan. Ryan came to our offices maybe about six months ago, and, um, and I thought I was going to hear new music. And, <laughs> and instead of hearing new music, uh, Ryan showed us this new app that he, that he built that, uh, that I was completely impressed with. And not only was I impressed with the app, I was also impressed with the fact that Ryan actually wrote the first code to the app. So uh, can you just talk, talk about what you built and how, and how you got there and what's, what's, what's happening in that space right now. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, about, uh, about 18 months ago, I decided that uh, I wanted to actually know everyone who actually had bought my record legally. And so when I went to iTunes, I said, hey, um, can you guys give me a CSV of everybody who bought my album? They obviously said no, right? So I went to Amazon and Google Play. I said, hey, can you guys, you know, can I go to, is there somewhere I can log in and download a CSV of everybody who bought my album? They said no. Uh, so I decided, okay, well, if I want to be able to have that consumer data, precision consumer data on the people who've actually supported my music, I think I might be able to extend my career by like 10 or 20 or maybe 50 years. Uh, and so I decided that in order for me to do that, I needed to take advantage of direct-to-consumer business or direct-to-consumer platforms which allowed people to transact directly with me. And so uh, initially I started with just uh, Google Voice, right? So I decided, hey, anybody who downloads my record, you can have my phone number, which was a Google Voice number, right? And I will actually, for the first time in the history of music business, and we can do it by a show of hands, if you've ever bought an album legally before, by show of hands, if you received a thank you text from the record company or the artists themselves, raise your hand, right? So unless you bought my album, which I know you actually got a thank you text because I, I thank every <laughs> single person who got, buys my albums, right? But in any case, that was the actual premise. I just wanted to be able to say thank you to everyone who in this age where anyone can get music for free, I wanted to be able to say thank you to the people who actually cared enough and were affected enough by my music to actually still pay for it in some way. And then what I realized is that for the first time, I started to see patterns in who was actually supporting my art. And so for the first time, I could log in every single day and see, oh, okay, well, somebody from Google who's an engineer at Google actually likes my music. Whereas I probably thought all of my fans were like, you know, hot girls in New York City, right? <laughs> so, so, so all of a sudden I realized, wow, I'm actually appealing to people beyond what I actually thought. And what I realized um, is that uh, I was actually able to, selling a tenth, a tenth of the number of records that I sold on my first major label debut, I made 10 times the money in royalties because I was actually collecting all the money. But not really because I was collecting all the money, but because being able to say thank you and being able to directly market via mobile messaging, right? It allowed me to have a 50% conversion rate. So anybody who sent me a text message, one out of every two people decided to spend money with me, whether it was on music or on, on an experience or whatever it was. And so I needed to build something that could help me keep track of it. And so I built basically a fan phone 
And so all of my fans, including my mom, who's my biggest number one fan, they <laughs> can text. How much has she spent? Oh, well, you know, <laughs> she's probably spent about 300000 you know, uh, trying because she got me through Harvard, too, you know. So, so she's my number, number one. But uh, in any case, it allows me to actually keep track of everyone who's actually supporting me. And so when you think about D2C, um, up to this point, and I think Jimmy Iovine actually made a comment that he would kill to know all the people on a precision level who actually were buying Interscope's product. product. And so for me, here's the first time as I sit here, I'm, I'm an artist that's pioneering this model that, uh, that uh, when you know your people and you can build an engaged relationship, the exchange isn't even just about money sometimes. Maybe someone who's a film student, who's actually a music video director, can actually go get me rentals on equipment, et cetera, and shoot. And instead of a video that would have cost me $30,000, I can shoot it for $5,000. So that's a $25,000 investment in my career from someone who really likes my art. So it's really about contacts as currency. Um, and so that means I needed to build an application that would allow me to very scalably not only uh, uh, organize all of my contacts, but also communicate with them one-to-one um, -one at scale. So that's what my app does. Yeah. Well, I, well, a lot of people, you know, going to, to your point of people paying for music, uh, a lot of people think music should be free. And, um, you know, and I think it's something to be said, you know, we're at, you know, a, a conference that focuses a lot on technology. And um, so when we look at, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google search, and a lot of the larger platforms that, you know, now have over billions of users, um, is there ever a model where music will be free in exchange for data or anything like that? Are there any trends that you guys are seeing? Or should music always have a price point in order to uh, let people know that, you know that there's value in creativity? I mean, I, 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 I don't want to jump in, but this, I would, This was for anybody, by yeah, the way. You're the artist, you should say something about yeah, it. Yeah, no, I think that, uh, I think you should give people the option, right? So one, one of my friends is, is and actually a, and a new investor in, in my startup is Benji Rogers, who founded Pledge Music. And he said his pitch when he would walk into record companies was uh, a very simple one. He would say, okay, imagine I'm a Beyonce fan and I've actually downloaded all her music for free. And one day I wake up and I feel guilty and I want to go to her website and just give her a hundred dollars for all the music I've downloaded. We want to, as artists, we want to be able to give people the option to actually support us in that way. And so if 10 albums of free music eventually triggers someone to say, oh, I want to see this artist in concert, or oh, I just want to go to their website and give them 100 bucks, then I think that option should always be there. And I do see that happening already. And uh, next to the pure transaction model where actually you know, a consumer buys for a piece of music, we see the economy of reach also entering music where brands for example sponsor artists they sponsor content and obviously then uh, users have the option to consume that kind of music free but we should be clear about one thing in the digital age which is actually what the user wants for free is one thing but the other question if, if the artist wants to get money or produce for free or not and I think they're discussing disruption quite a lot and discussing digital business models I think um, uh, we should understand that writing a hit is something that is not substitutable and um, that all the disruption we've been um, preaching about uh, even during the last 48 hours, um, if you look at the music industry and if you look at artistry, um, I can tell you that the most disruptive moment I at least know, and this has been going on for centuries, that's the moment where an artist sits in front of a blank sheet of paper with a pen trying to pin down the first words of his future hit. That's disruption. That's disruption in creative industry like the music industry. And this is what it will be all about. And this is also why I pledge for a digital economy where creativity, if the artist wants to earn money with his music or her music, should be able. Did you have you know, one of the things that you have to do is you've got to develop the next generation of talent. It doesn't cost nothing, it costs something to develop it. You can, of course, encourage people to get music for free that would then get them to go and see a concert, and if the band or the artist is very good live, then that will lead to a demand for their music. But if you look at the number one record this week in the United States, and I think also in the UK, it's called Uptown Funk. 
by Mark Ronson, who's a producer working with Bruno Mars. It's a fantastic record. It's a fantastic video. It's a fantastic song. It costs money to make that. And people, who, people will buy that record because it is so good. It's, uh, one always has to be aware of the fact that you have to nurture new talent. How are we going to discover the next Paul McCartney, the next Jay-Z, the next uh, uh, big uh, German artist? Uh, there does require a craft development from uh, the a and people, artist and repertoire, and the I and R people, innovation and repertoire. So, so speaking of discovery, um, let's, let's go to YouTube. Um, do, do you guys view YouTube as a discovery mechanism or, uh, or, or purveyor of piracy? You know, we got these two sides of, uh, of the argument with, with, with YouTube. So YouTube's been extremely valuable for so far since day one. Um, since our very first show, we filmed uh, and released session videos um, of every artist who performed. That was, that was great for both those artists, some of whom either got discovered or went on to greater things off the back of it. And it was great for our growth as well, as many people discovered us and, uh, and got in touch and wanted to set up shows in their own city. So as a shop front for us, it was always been invaluable. For YouTube, for me, is the reason why I even have a fan base, right? So uh, when I first started, I was making um, demos in a one-bedroom apartment in Harlem. And, uh, you know, I, I was making uh, videos to promote myself, but they weren't music videos. They were just videos of me actually creating the music. And uh, there wasn't an outlet for those videos. You, I couldn't go to MTV and say, hey, I, I want to play this, uh, you know, right after the Jay-Z video, you should play a video of me in my one-bedroom apartment, like, picking away with, like, shaking a cup of change, you know, as a hi-hat. And, and so YouTube was really the only outlet where I was able to just create those small, easily digestible pieces of content and put them out there and allow people to be able to easily share them, discuss them, and then have an ability to come back and discover me and, and, and be excited about what I was doing. And so without YouTube, um, I, I honestly, I, I wouldn't be sitting here. And then now that uh, I'm able to monetize, now I do think YouTube actually from a monetization standpoint is competitive with Spotify. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's competitive with Spotify. And so for premium video content, it's very awesome that I do have my niche fan base. I know the folks who want to support. And so I'm able to actually release video content to them uh, at a premium price before I release it for free on YouTube for pennies and uh, what, per we're, stream. And we're partnered with, do you release that content with, or is it a proprietary uh, uh, player that you release it in with your app? Oh, no, so um, I actually, you know, my, my storefront, I have a lot of great partners, uh, whether it's Gumroad, Shopify, uh, and Vimeo actually plugs in. Uh, so I, I've built a crazy development community, and so there's a guy by the name of uh, Andrew Narkowitz who built a, met, uh, a method by which people can actually buy a stream, and then it can play from Vimeo. So Vimeo, we've actually hacked the Vimeo uh, I, Maybe I shouldn't say that, but we've actually basically hacked the Vimeo uh, on demand to be able to do it through my storefront so then I can actually still co collect data on every stream. Great. And, um, so, and from a record label standpoint, how, how are you guys looking at YouTube as a partner? I think both, of, both sides of your question are, are true to some extent. I mean, YouTube is the biggest and the most powerful music machine we have on the, on, on the globe. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very powerful tool to connect people, to surface talent. Um, and on the other hand, um, I, do, I would agree with you that we would, especially with regards, for example, to the situation in Germany, uh, I would like to see a better monetization situation with YouTube because there are artists, I mean, it's really, there should be choice, you know? If there are artists who say, okay, I want my stuff on YouTube and I'm fine without earning anything, that's cool with me. Um, on the other hand, there are, there are artists who, who would like to have a better monetization from YouTube and who would love to have their stuff out there, and they should have the chance to do so. Mm -hmm. So both sides of the coin, coin are there, and I think we need just to, to work even more cooperatively, and we really need to, to improve the monetization situation. But in general, obviously, we, we, we love a lot of aspects in partnering with YouTube, and on the other hand, we would love to see our artists um, 
getting more money from them. Now, now, going back to what you guys were talking about, just in terms of like the accessibility and like even giving fans, your, you know, your, what they feel, you know, is your personal number and a way in a way to reach you. It used to be a time where you know. Prince would only show one half of his face, and you know, it was about this mystique. Um, do you think that those barriers are now broken down and fans kind of feel like you owe, you owe them that access in exchange for that, that support? Is it, you know? Well, I, I think we'll go back to what he was talking about. I mean, the mystique is the, the magic of cre creativity and creation, right? So, um, you know, the, the ability to see a master at work, whether it's Michael Jordan, whether it's, you know, Prince, whether, I mean, I was still, even if I had access to be able to call Prince every day, I still have the utmost reverence because of what this man can actually do. And I mean, I've heard the, I've heard the, the legend of how he got signed. He was in the studio and then all of a sudden, you know, all the executives were watching him and he just got on the drums and played for four minutes. Then he said, bring me a bass. He played the bass for four minutes. Bring me a guitar, played the guitar for four minutes. Turn on the mic and sang a song just like that. There's so few people in the world who can do that and do it at that level. And I think he was 16 at the time, right? So to be able to do that at that level, I think there's still gonna be that reverence. And for me, even if it's just a thousand people in the world or 10,000 people in the world who respect it and who find value in it, those are the people I wanna know personally. And so if I, that means I need to give a little more because social media has made artists more accessible, then that's something I'm prepared to do. Yeah, I think um, just because the artist is close to you, like virtually or in our case, physically, uh, it doesn't make mean that their mystique um, disappears at all. I remember we put on a show on this incredible avant-garde cellist called Oliver Coates, um, and there was 50 people in the room all crammed in on the floor watching him, uh, and he blew everybody away. And people were, would still uh, wouldn't even want to talk to him afterwards because uh, there was none of the none of the magic had been lost by the fact that he was right there. You know, Troy, a really interesting development of the YouTube era is that it's producing a whole new generation of really huge global YouTube stars. Uh, we recently had a big event in Singapore, just pulling in the top YouTube stars from all over Asia. It was a musical person, a, a comedian. There was a woman from Japan. She calls herself cooking with a dog. She doesn't put the dog in the pot to cook it. The dog stands next to her, and when she cooks, she speaks to the dog, the dog wags its tail. But I'll tell you an interesting story about what happened with these YouTube stars. They now are attracting big audiences, sold out in London, sold out in Berlin, sold out in Mumbai, sold out in Singapore. And there's a very interesting story of a young British guy. He's 19 years old. His name is Jacob Collier. He sings everything, he plays everything. Quincy Jones saw one of his clips on YouTube and has flown him to Los Angeles, going to be managing him. Now, Quincy Jones is one of the greatest producers of all time. But the point is that out of YouTube, you're getting in the 14 to 18 year old demographic, a whole new fan base of YouTube stars. An incredible momentum that you get from those stars. It's amazing, amazing. Well, I know we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted you guys to be able to um, answer some questions from, from the audience. Um, can, you, can we, we have a question over here, if there's a microphone? Okay. Hi, oh, hello. Uh, the question is to Ryan. Um, my name is Alex Icon. YouTube creator. I, I remember when you used to be shaking stuff on YouTube, so it's great to see you on stage. But I just wanted to ask you, uh, what was the moment when you changed your mind about Spotify? Because you said you didn't have your albums there. And uh, also for the future, how do you monetize kind of uh, outside of music? Because so many artists don't have the capacity of the business mindset that you have. So what would you kind of recommend to them to develop to be not just an artist, but a business person as well, in an age when you're making zero from music. Right, so um, I think really what happened for me is just um, the accessibility of Spotify. So when I would run into fans and they wouldn't know about my new record, um, and you know, the, I mean, 
here's, here's kind of the interesting thing. Like, I, I'll run into people at the airport, right? And I'll say, yo, did you get my last album? They'll say, yeah. And they'll name an album from like two albums ago, right? Because they don't even know that I have a new body of workout. And the first thing they'll ask is, is it on Spotify? And so Spotify is really just a great, uh, uh, great distribution platform for people to be able to even just listen to what you've got. And what I found is that people who want to support, especially when they know that I know, they actually will still support anyhow. So that's why I, I thought for this new release, I'll put it on Spotify. Now, in terms of monetizing outside of just music alone, the number one and most expensive way to monetize yourself as an artist, at least in my experience, is to give people something that's priceless. And what I feel is priceless in terms of being an artist is always gonna be an experience. And so um, just over this last New Year's, um, this happened kind of by accident last year. I threw a party and I, I, I just put it out there to all my fans. I said, look, if you guys reserve at a 200 euro price point, a ticket to my New Year's Eve party, I'll throw a private New Year's Eve party. I didn't have a venue, I didn't have anything. 48 hours later, I was up 40,000 euros and I rented a palace in Vienna, Austria and 200 of my top fans came to Vienna, Austria and had a big party with me for New Year's Eve. And then this year, we did it again and this time I said, well, if you guys want a super exclusive package, the, the tickets are $1,700 and we still had 50 people pay $1,700 to come. And because really, uh, an experience is something that people can't download. I mean, they, you, you, could, you could play it on YouTube afterwards, right? But that intimate experience, that access uh, for people who, you know, may never get to run into me at the airport, take a picture with me, whatever it is, it's something they're willing to, 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 to invest in because it's not really about the money, it's, it's really about a priceless moment. And so I would worry about trying to figure out ways that you can give interactions, whether they're virtual or whether they're in person, because those are the, those are the moments uh, that I think people are gonna value the most. And that, that's what I value most about being here is the ability to interact directly with folks. We have time for a couple more questions. Any more? We have one in the back over there. Okay, one, one over here. Yeah. So um, live music is booming. They're making a lot of money. Uh, promotions are coming in, sponsorships. But the recording industry is still suffering. Uh, does uh, subscription models work, downloads? Uh, physical sales, CDs, records. So do you think these models should be uh, uh, improved or there should be another model that gets the best of everything in order to uh, repair recording industry to its further uh, value? Yeah, let me take that one. So there is more music out there than ever and there are more listeners of music out there than ever. And um, many of them pay for it. Um, if you look, for example, at the German market, um, we don't have the final data yet, but the German market, for example, the German music market is up compared to last year, which is a great message which shows that music, although being in a challenge like 10, 15 years ago, is now really back on track. And this is driven by digital development, by the de development of digital forms and formats of music. And streaming definitely is spearheading that. Now, if you ask me which of these formats, might it be the CD, might it be vinyl, might it be the stream, uh, should actually be the winner of that race, I can only say none of them. For us, the best thing is um, if the music lover can buy and get the music in whatever format he loves. And if you look at, uh, for example, the vinyl market, vinyl is a format that is just skyrocketing at the moment in a very small scale, but it is. So I think we should have as many formats of distributing and offering music out there as possible. And as I just said, especially in Germany, where we still have half of our music sales being physical and the rest being digital in different formats, we see this is a very, that makes a strong and healthy music market for the artists, but also for the record industry. And I think we're going to take one more question over here. Yeah, hi, my name's, hi, hi, my name's Felix. Uh, just got a quick, quick question to the fan and all of you. Pick your fan brain. Who's your artist to watch for 2.15 and, and why? Thank you. 
I think you already said Jacob Collier, right? <laughs> well, I like Jacob Let's Collier. Let's go to YouTube. Okay. So what's happening on YouTube? Uh, for me, someone to watch because of her sheer artistry is Taylor Swift. She's 24. She makes incredible music. She has a global following. I know to some in the audience here, she might be over-commercial, but in terms of someone with an inherent talent that's really hitting the world all over the world, she's, she's somebody that... I think you, is going to become a, a great uh, artist for all of, of the future, if she already is. Uh, I think for me is FKA Twigs, um, who's an artist um, signed to the Young Turks group. Um, uh, he's just an extremely forward-thinking multimedia entertainer beyond just uh, beyond just artist, and putting together great partnerships such as with Glass, the Google Glass recently. Uh, and added on to that, she has great songs, so. So I'd say for the international music space, I'd probably pick Megan Trainer. She is not too known here yet, but um, she'll have a big career. I'm very positive about that. She already has had a big hit, and um, I'm sure she's going to be very successful in our market uh, next year or this year, and maybe if you look at I'm German... I'm Megan's manager, so he has to say that. <laughs> uh, just, trying, just trying to get out of this uh, without any more overtime. Uh, and if I look at um, German talent, I'd say it's probably Johannes Oerding, who's one of these very special artists who not only write and record great songs, but who also deliver life experience, which is second to none. Great. And on my end, I think it would be uh, a new client, uh, Rin Weaver, who uh, is just a, an incredible musician who we, you know, just kind of walks that line of artistic and commercial uh, sensibility. So excited about Rin Weaver. Is he signed to Sony? Yet? Universal. Oh, <laughs> next, Sony gets the next one. I got to go back and forth. So if I had to name one, I would say, you know, one of my friends and uh, favorite people to collaborate with. Um, I'm always excited about what he does anytime he drops anything. Uh, and if the collaboration with Paul McCartney is any indication of uh, how people are going to respond to his body of work, which I've had the pleasure of hearing already, actually at Ben Horowitz's house, he played his album. It'd be Kanye West in 2015. It's going to be it's going to be a great year for him. So that's my homie. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for uh, for, for joining me, and thank you, DLD. Yeah. Perfect.